Hi, uh, students of Paul. It's nice to see you again. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the basic structure of a Pauline letter. Um, it's important that we actually know something about the structure of a Pauline letter and why, why is that so? Because structure tells us something about, um, about what a letter is designed to do. Structure of anything tells us about, about what something is designed to do if you're studying uh, animals. And, uh, and the thing, the animal has fins, well, you know where it's designed to live. If it has wings, you, you know something else about where it's designed to live. Likewise, uh, in terms of Pauline letters, um, once we know something about the structure of a Pauline letter, then we know something we can read more about what it's designed to do. Um, and so um, without further ado, let's go into the basic structure of a Pauline letter. It may be news to you to know that Paul's letters, almost all, all of the, the, the undisputed Pauline letters in the New Testament, the seven undisputed letters, all follow uh, roughly the same pattern. And uh, let's take a look at that. The following slides contain a breakdown of a typical, in quotation marks, Pauline letter. So the basics. Paul's letters were not unusual in their form. Paul did not invent the letter style that we see in the New Testament. Now, he may have um, perfected or invented or borrowed certain parts of it from the early uh, Jesus movement. Um, but in general, the letters follow a fairly uh, standard uh, pattern, as we will know from compare, comparing them to other first century letters, like the kind that have been found in, the, uh, in uh, Oxyrhynchus in Alexandria, Egypt, other first century letters. So the basics. Paul's letters were not unusual in their form. They followed a fairly standard first century pattern and style with some differences. Paul's letters were often penned by a scribe. So that's another thing that a lot of people who are brand new to Paul may not realize. Paul did not write his own letters. Again, that's not that unusual. Uh, Paul used a scribe, which uh, in the ancient world was called a, an amanuensis, an amanuensis or a scribe. Um, often that scribe, uh, uh, in, to many, uh, in many cases, a scribe would have been a slave, uh, uh, an educated slave. Sometimes slaves were more educated than their masters in, in the, enslaved persons were more educated than their masters in the Roman Empire. Um, but in, in Paul's case, uh, probably most often this would have been a colleague, uh, maybe somebody who, to whom Paul was mentor, um, and that would be the, the scribe or the amanuensis. And quite often that person would also deliver the letter. Um, and that brings up the next point. Paul's letters were written to be performed. Uh, that's something else that we, we just don't know. We live in a culture of reading. Now that's changing actually in the 21st century, uh, where we're going back to orality and, and the digital world. But Paul's letters were written to be performed, not to be read individually and silently. And the common reason for that is that most people in, uh, in the first century could not read. So uh, Paul was not writing for somebody to sit down and read it in, uh, you know, by the lamplight. Paul's letters were written to be performed. And that again is, was common in the first century. We don't have the verbal instructions with which he coached the messengers. And that's too bad because those verbal instructions probably um, would, well, they would have told us so much more about these letters if we knew that at one point when Paul says, and when you say, um, don't take each other to court, look over to the right-hand corner of the room and look at these people. I mean, Paul probably said that to his, to his uh, messenger, but we don't have those um, verbal instructions anymore, and it's really too bad. It would give us even more context. Paul's letters were written to be performed. We don't have those verbal instructions. His audience received his letters orally, almost certainly in every case. Um, maybe Philemon, perhaps not completely, but even in the case of Philemon, which was written for an individual, uh, it was probably read out in front of a household. And in the ancient world, a household was a whole group of people. It was an expanded group, including uh, gardeners and enslaved persons who did all kinds of things. Um, and including um, uh, aunts and uncles and, and uh, brothers and sisters and, and, um, and, and supposed aunts and uncles and, and so on. Paul employed rhetorical techniques. So what does this mean? In Paul's letters, not only does he follow a standard uh, format of how he orders things, but he also employs a standard way of, of um, communicating, which is rhetoric. And rhetoric was and is the art of persuasion. And you you did certain things in a certain way in order to try and convince somebody of something else. So, for instance, uh, we might think of it in terms of um, a certain type of of uh, speech. So, if you come from certain communities, 
um, there are certain ways of talking that don't make sense outside of that community, but make sense within that community. In the first century world, um, and for much of human history, rhetoric has been incredibly important. So Paul used rhetorical techniques typical of his day, such as ethos, pathos, and logos. Uh, we'll be talking about those in a different uh, in a different session, so I won't say much more about them now. Ethos is uh, appeal to character. I'm such a good person, so I wouldn't lie to you. Pathos is an appeal to emotion. If you don't do what I'm asking you to do, I'm going to be really, really sad. And logos is an appeal to rationality or logic. If you pay attention to this um, this uh, video, and if you really learn it well, you will do well on your exam. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, you will do well on the exam. So Paul used all of those in addition to diatribes, which are like rants, essentially, kriya, which are like sayings, the early bird gets the worm, and other means to get his point across and to convince his audiences. So basically then, Paul used a standard format of letter writing and he used standard ways of arguing. And uh, all of these things were fairly common in the first century. He was not unique. Uh, now, um, so here are some of the, basically you can, you can use this video presentation to look at all kinds of Paul's letters and other ancient letters. Um, but I want you to know that not all Pauline letters contain all of these elements. So it starts off with the sender. And ancient letters always start with the name of the sender. There's no such thing as a dear sir or madame or dear Matthew in my case, or dear professor or something like that. It's always Paul or Matthew or uh, Susanna or whatever it might be. So you start with your name and your title. So in, in this case, it would be Matthew, professor of uh, Pauline studies, uh, together with um, other professors of Pauline studies. So it might be co-senders to, um, and then the recipients, to the students of Paul who are in Montreal. And then there's benediction or greetings. Greetings, ancient letters would say greetings. And Paul and the other um, first Jesus followers, uh, it seems uh, changed that greetings to grace and peace. So there was a, a slight change there. They changed the word greetings or maybe peace to grace and peace uh, to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, this, this formula. And then came something called a thanksgiving or an exordium, uh, which is not present in Galatians, which is, um, is a, a way of, of sort of buttering up a person for the letter. So let's take a look at the next slide. I'm giving you some examples of all of this. Sender and title, Paul, uh, a slave of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. By the way, the uh, New Revised Standard Version says servant of Jesus Christ. But um, various... Uh, um, uh, black uh, biblical studies persons and womenist uh, biblical studies uh, scholars have pointed out that um, that 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 um, that changes the dynamic to say Paul a servant because a servant is often a paid uh, person and Paul the word that Paul uses doulos it actually means slave and of course in the context of the Roman Empire and the time that Paul was writing when for him to use that term he almost certainly meant an enslaved person so Paul calls himself an enslaved person. Um, but also called to be an apostle. And that's an interesting thing. Uh, so sender and title, and you would put the title in. So I might say, Matthew, a professor of Pauline studies, called to be the instructor of this course, together with Silvanus and Timothy, Paul says in First Thessalonians, recipients to the assembly. And again, the New Revised Standard Version always says church of God. Um, a lot of us prefer not to use the word church. And the reason is that when we think church, we think of a building with a steeple and, uh, and a history. Um, but in, when Paul was writing, uh, there was no such thing as this long Christian history. And he used the term um, ecclesia or ecclesia. And that means basically, um, it's a term borrowed from Greek, political structure. And it means an assembly or a group. To the assembly of God that is in Corinth, called to be saints. Benediction or greetings, grace to you and peace. Uh, in a non-Jesus uh, following letter, it might have said greetings. And then in a thanksgiving or an exordium. And Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in Philippians. He also says something similar in most of his other letters, not Galatians. And it's interesting, there's a real purpose to this thanksgiving because um, quite often if, you'll, if you want something, you might say, uh, dear professor, I know that you are a most understanding person. Well, why do you say that? because there's going to be something coming next. I want you to know uh, 
dear understanding professor that um, I didn't get a chance to watch the video last night or whatever it might be. So you have that structure always at the beginning. Uh, let's go back and take a look. You have these structures at the beginning of pollen letter greeting, salutation, sender, co-senders, recipients, benedictions, thanksgiving. And then you move on to the main argument. So this is wildly different in all of Paul's letters because each of them is dealing with something very different. But Paul does tend to use the same sort of language throughout as we all do. So he will say something in an introductory formula, and then there'll be main arguments, some exhortations, which means um, encouragements, and then the main issue or the issues of the letter. So in Galatians, his main point is that he does not want non-Jewish Christ followers to follow the Torah. We're in Romans, uh, discussion about what is the body of Christ, what is justification, uh, what is God's covenant through the Messiah, and so on. In 1 Corinthians, Paul's argument is really about the unity of the community and about the, uh, some advice on, the, on what's going on ethically in the community. And the same with other letters. Uh, so all of Paul's undisputed letters have different issues. Um, so this is really where the letter takes on its own character, where they're all different. So you've got the introduction, then you've got the main body of the letter. And the main arguments, uh, the main kind of language that Paul uses in the introductory formula. So Philippians, I want you to know, beloved. Now I appeal to you, or I am astonished, Paul uses these kinds of terms um, more than once, quite often. And then his main arguments, initial, initial exhortations, I appeal that all of you be in agreement in 1 Corinthians. If anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, let that person be cursed. That's in a, that is really a, a formal curse, uh, which is, again, was not unusual in the ancient world and still happens in, in our world in some places where there's a, a sort of formal putting a curse on something. And Paul does that several times in his letters. We just don't always recognize it because of our 21st century Western context. Then the main issue or issues of the letter in Galatians uh, and in Romans and in 1 Corinthians and so on, as we've talked about. Okay, so from the main arguments, uh, he will say uh, these different things, thesis form, he'll use all of these uh, different things. I'm passing on what I first received. Did you not know that? Um, he'll make all of these arguments. And then he comes to his closing. And now this is interesting too, because again, you've got a fairly standard opening and a fairly standard closing. And it's in between that you get the, the meat and the, the real differences between each of the Pauline letters. But the openings are fairly similar and the closings are quite similar. And they often have some of these ingredients. So they all have a personal signature. Paul will write, see with what large letters I am writing. Now, again, it says a couple of things. One is, it's interesting, um, nobody signed. There was never a signature at the end of an ancient letter. In other words, it didn't say yours truly, Apostle Paul. No such thing in the ancient world. Instead, what uh, people did was that they would have the um, amanuensis or the scribe who would be writing down what they dictated. And then they would grab the pen or the, the nib and they would write just one sentence and he would, and so Paul wrote in one case, see with what large letters I'm writing when I write with my own hand, which might mean that he was, you know, had bad eyesight. It might mean he wasn't such a great writer. Um, I'm not sure, but he writes that one little sentence so that you can look at the letter and go, oh yeah, that's Paul's handwriting. Now, why did you do that? To authenticate that it really was from you, which means that in the first century, it was known that there were forgeries from time to time. Also in the closing of a Pauline letter would be personal greetings to others. Greet, um, greet uh, Phoebe, greet uh, Stephanos, and so on and on. Then there's something called the apostolic parousia, which simply means uh, plans to come see you. I expect to be with you soon or prepare for my arrival in Philemon. He says, prepare a room for me. Uh, in Romans, this comes also at the beginning and other practical matters like that. And then sometimes at the uh, closing of a Pauline letter, you get formulaic blessings and curses. Let anyone who uh, be accursed who has no love for the Lord. That's 1 Corinthians, the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Sometimes there's a kiss of peace. Uh, give each other a kiss of peace from me. And then final commands, let no one trouble me or don't forget what I've told you. And then finally a benediction quite often in the Pauline letters. The grace of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah be with you all. Or um, in 1 Corinthians, our Lord come is Maranatha. Um, so the closing again, so again, just to point out, the opening of a Pauline letter is quite formulaic and fairly standard. 
The closing is also fairly formulaic and quite standard, and it's what's in between that's usually fairly different in the Pauline letters. So uh, that's a very quick intro to the standard structure of a Pauline letter, and um, I'm looking forward to talking more with you as we go through um, the Pauline letters and we look and see how these things actually, uh, how they actually look. So thanks and see you next time.